The raising of Lazarus in John 11 is the last of the signs in the book of signs. And after this, so many people began to follow Jesus that the Jewish leaders were overwhelmed. In John eleven forty seven, this passage that you see on the screen comes up. The chief priests and Pharisees convened a council and were saying, what are we going to do? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away our place and the nation. So <clears throat> if we were to follow this into chapter 12, you know the story of the triumphal entry of Jesus when he's coming down the mountain and they're all laying down the palm branches. That was a direct result of the raising of Lazarus and a dinner that took place where Jesus was sitting there and Lazarus was sitting right next to Jesus after being raised from the dead. And such a furor of attention was uh, gained by that that the people were basically going crazy. So right before this happens, the Jewish council meets and they're desperate to get rid of Jesus. But one of them... Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, Joseph Caiaphas was the son-in-law of the old godfather high priest Annas. Annas was actually high priest from A.D. 6 to A.D. 14. <clears throat> and Joseph Caiaphas was his son-in-law. And along with other members of his family, people were appointed as high priest, but he became high priest in A.D. 26 and stayed as high priest until A.D. 36, Caiaphas did. So John is being somewhat sarcastic because high priests were supposed to be there for life. And John says he was high priest that year. And uh, he said, you know nothing at all, talking to the rest of the members of the Sanhedrin nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation perish. Now, if we just read that verse, we'd think, you know, Caiaphas, you're such a really good guy and religious guy, and you knew that God was going to sacrifice Jesus for the sins of the people. No. See, Caiaphas was saying, it's better for us to kill this one guy so that the Romans won't come down here and kill all of us and take away our place and destroy our city. That's what he was really meaning to say. But John says in the next verse or two that even though Caiaphas didn't realize it, he told the truth. He prophesied anyway, see, because he was saying something that was really going to happen. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation and not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Now, if you want to write a little note in your Bible, <clears throat> write down John 10, 16, right there, where Jesus said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold he was talking about the Gentile people who would come to Christ. And here in this prophecy, uh, Jesus says he was, you know, he said it right, but he not only died for the people, that is the people of Israel, but for all those others, see? 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says he died for the sins of the whole world, you and me included. So from that day... They really set out to kill Jesus because if he didn't die, then there were going to be a whole lot of people die because he was getting too much of a following and the Romans didn't like that. All right? <clears throat> so in chapter 12, you have the triumphal entry. Everybody's saying Hosanna to the son of David, Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem. And then we have a kind of a significant turning point that happens in the book of John. Um, anybody want to bring up anything here as a question before we move on to that? Anybody? <clears throat> I need all the help I can get today. All right. 
Let me see. Let me hold my mouth right here. Hold my mouth right. Change him to that next one for me, Scott. Hit, yeah, there you go. So in chapter 12, we have a, a turning point in the, in the book of John where um, it comes down to the, the point of, of uh, God's redemptive work and, and there's the completion of this phrase that's been occurring throughout all of the, uh, the book of John. So John's gospel can be kind of outlined briefly like this. Chapters 1 through 12, I call it the book of signs. The book of signs is where all the signs happen that Jesus does. Okay? Then starting at the end of chapter 12 and going on forward, chapters 13 through 17 are the Last Supper. What happened at the Last Supper? Okay? Chapter 18 through 20, 18 and 19 that is, are the death of Christ, and chapter 20 and 21 are the resurrection and post-resurrection appearances of Christ. So book of signs, five chapters of what goes on at the Last Supper, death of Christ, two chapters, resurrection of Christ, two chapters, okay? So way back earlier in the book of John, <clears throat> in the story of the turning of the water to wine, you know, Jesus' mother tries to force him to do this sign. He's not ready. He says, you know, woman, my hour has not yet come. Because Jesus feels like that once he starts doing this, the ball will start rolling really fast and his death will come really quickly. When you come to chapter 7 and verse 30, He's at the temple in Jerusalem during this big free-for-all where everybody's telling their opinions about Jesus. And they try to arrest him, but it says no man laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. See? Same idea. At the end of that discussion in chapter 8, when he's still teaching at the temple, <clears throat> they tried to arrest him again. But they didn't do it because it says his hour had not yet come. See? The word hour doesn't literally mean 60 minutes. It means a crucial time, a time in history. And many years ago, a German theologian by the name of Hans Konzelman wrote a book called Der Mitte der Zeit, which means the midpoint of time. And he saw the midpoint of time as this moment in time when the redemptive work of God was done in the death and resurrection. Everything before it was one way, everything after it was another way. See, the midpoint of time. The hour had not yet come. But see, in chapter 12, verse 22, this perspective changes. You know, there are some Greeks that come seeking Jesus, and Philip comes and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came and they told Jesus, and all of a sudden Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So this time, this point, this event that he had been thinking toward and living toward and walking toward um, was upon us, see? And so in verse 27 of chapter 12, if you look down a few verses beyond verse 20, <clears throat> Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this purpose I came to this hour. So see, Jesus' face had been set to Jerusalem. He knew that the Son of Man would be delivered up by the chief priests, scribes, and elders. He would be punished by them. He would be turned over to Pilate. He'd be crucified. He knew this was coming. See, the hour has come. And when he realizes it's, it's, I can't avoid it anymore. It's right here, right now. The time has come. He said, Lord, glorify your name. He's talking about through his death and resurrection. God comes back and says, I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. 
See, if you turn back from chapter 12, I have glorified it, glorified it in the doing of all these signs. I will glorify it in the great death and resurrection <clears throat> of Jesus. All right? So look at chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, by the way, this is Passover week, right? Okay. And Jesus is the Lamb of God, right? And what time of year was the Lamb of God killed in Judaism? Passover time. And on the 14th day of the first month, which is the springtime month, <clears throat> their months don't match up with our months. But on the 14th day of Abib, which would be this past week, the lamb is killed at evening. They roast it. They have their Seder, their Passover service, see? And on the first Sunday after Passover, that's today. See, that's when Jesus Christ rose from the dead approximately 1,993 years ago. Okay? And that's that's fact. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, so it was now right before the Passover feast, and Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, now this defines it, that he should depart from this world and go to the Father. So when he said, my hour has not yet come, my hour has not yet come, my hour has not yet come, he meant it's not time yet for me to depart from this world and go to the Father, right? Now, one of these days, guess what you and I are going to do? We're going to do that same thing, aren't we? All right, but this was his hour. This was his time. Now, Let's all open our Bibles together, <clears throat> if you have one. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you don't have one, reach under the pew and get one. And open your Bible to uh, John 13. And in your own Bible, um, look at verse 2. John 13, 2. See, on the one we have on the screen, during supper during the supper, when supper had come. All right, this is talking about the Passover supper. Now, if you write down in a little note there, Matthew 26, 20. Matthew 26, 20 tells you when Jesus sat down at the Passover, who was he with? <clears throat> it was Jesus and the 12 apostles. And they sat down for that Passover meal. Now, flip over to John 18. John 18. And look at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, and that covers a lot of territory back to John 13, he went out. <clears throat> See, they started supper at John 13, verse 2. And they didn't go out. See, the Seder, the Passover, lasted several hours. They didn't go out until John 18, 1. So everything between John 13, 2 and John 18, 1 is a private conversation between Jesus and the 12 apostles. However, at the end of John 13, one of the apostles gets up and goes out into the darkness. Who's that? Judas. Okay. So after that, it's only 11 of the apostles that are there. Now, John is very cognizant of this, and many people who read this think that everything in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 
is talking to you and me. This is Jesus speaking very specifically to his apostles about their special role and what God will do through them in the world. Now, some things Jesus says to, to them are repeated in other places for us, <clears throat> but not nearly everything. It's really important to know that this is Jesus talking to his apostles. We're going to come back to that. All right, so he knew that the hour had come, and he's looking that hour right in the face. Now turn over to John 17. <clears throat> John 17. In verse 1, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. Notice how close that is to what he said in chapter 12, verse 27, 28. See, he, he's about to actually go to the cross, and he wants to glorify God in what he does as he goes to the cross and in the resurrection. He's scared to death, but he's going to do it anyway, and he wants to do it right. Say, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all you have given to him, he may give eternal life. All right, so the hour has come. So why does he keep saying it? Because he's been busy doing other things, and he's been busy getting ready, but now it's here, and he knows it. It's right here. It's right in front of him. It's immediate. It's now, you know. And so the impact of it is much stronger than it would be if it's just a theory. It's going to happen someday, you know. Yes, sir. The, the, the Gospel of John doesn't answer that. It is kind of strange that right before he says this in chapter 12, uh, by the way, for those of you out there, Damon's question was, was there anything special that happened that made him all of a sudden say that, that the hour has come? In chapter 12, verse 20, 21, somewhere in there, it says a bunch of Greeks came to see him. These were people from outside of Palestine. These were Greek-speaking Jews that had come to the feast. And somehow, maybe he took that as a sign that it was time. Maybe he felt the tension in the air and knew they were about to kill him, try to arrest him. I don't know what it was. But whatever it was, he said, the hour has come. And so he knew it was coming. <clears throat> he knew that this sit-down with his apostles at the Last Supper was his last shot at these guys in the flesh. It was his last time to talk to them. <clears throat> Think about this. If you were sitting with some young person that you had mentored, um, you know, George back there and Trevor, if George is sitting with Trevor and it's the last time he's going to have a chance to talk with Trevor, you know, what would you say to him if you knew this is the last time he was going to be able to talk to him and give him any advice about life, whatever, you know. So Jesus was, was with his disciples, and this was the last shot. Now, Jesus told them in this conversation, I'm going away. If you read the chapters before this, a couple chapters, <clears throat> Jesus was saying things like, I'm going away. And he told the Jewish leaders, where I'm going, you can't come. And they said, where's he going? What's he talking about? I'm going away. And his disciples looked at him, what's he talking about? And he would repeat this, I'm going away. And uh, he, he kept saying that at the Last Supper. And so his disciples got really worried and they got really upset and they got really, you know, their faces were showing that they didn't like this at all because they had come to depend on him and, and uh, lean on him and, 
And they couldn't imagine him not being there. And he says, Lo, I'm leaving. I'm going away. What? What's he talking about? What does he mean? He's going away. And then uh, Dave Ramsey actually didn't make up this phrase. Uh, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. And the reason he said that is he kept saying, I'm going away. And the disciples were like, what? What does he mean? What's, what's he talking about? They were upset. Uh, if you look at John 14, 27, he says, peace I give to you. You know, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives, but do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. Because he could see that they were very much afraid. What are we going to do <clears throat> if he goes away? And so this entire conversation at the Last Supper is preparing them <clears throat> to carry on after Jesus goes away. So he starts out with this, you know, this action. And, and it says, you know, in I think about verse 4, you know, Jesus, you know, knowing all things, you know, and that it's time for him to go, he knowing, you know, everything he knew about God and his plan, he gets up, lays aside his clothes, and he girds himself with a towel, and he starts washing the disciples' feet. And it's a loving service type thing. What are you doing? And three times in there, he says, I know you don't understand what I'm doing to you, but you will understand this later. And his basic point seems to be, you know, I've loved you and serving you, and I've, I'm going to love you and serve you now, but you're going to have to love each other and serve each other. And you guys need to be together, and you need to be loving each other and serving each other, because when I leave, you guys need to be tight, and you need to be loving and serving each other. Um, <clears throat> cup. Yes, sir, brother Mark. Yep. Yeah, he was delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So it was time, and Jesus knew that, but what about his disciples? See, they didn't have that same perspective at all, that many of their ideas about what he was going to do were totally wrong. He says, I'm leaving, and they were totally upset and destroyed by that, and he was trying to give them uh, some perspective. <clears throat> now, a little thing about temptation here. Look at John 13 and look at verse 2 again. Let's go back to this. During the supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now, if we go back to chapter 12, go back to chapter 12. Look at verse 4. This is when um, Mary anointed, Mary and Martha Mary, she had anointed Jesus with this very expensive ointment. Uh, John 12, 4. Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? John's comment. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but he was a thief. And having charged the money bag, he used to help himself into what was put into it. So see, Judas had been thieving all along. He had been extorting from the church treasury. See? And he was turned that way. He was a thief. And God knew he was a thief. And God knew he had a heart like that. And God also knew that Jesus needed to die. But God didn't make Judas do what he did. God knew what he'd do because of the kind of person he was. The devil 
put it into Judas's heart to betray him. So step one, church, <clears throat> the devil puts something into our heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So when the devil puts it in your heart, he knows your weakness, like he knew Judas's weakness, and he puts it in your heart. And if you turn it over and if you let it simmer and if you keep thinking about it and you keep considering it and you keep thinking about it even though you know it's not right, see, sooner or later, if you turn to John 13, 27, after he had taken the morsel and that's when they'd been sitting at the table for some time, you know, this service went on all evening. And Jesus said, whoever dips the piece of bread in the gravy with me, that's the one, you know. So Judas does that. When he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to uh, Judas. And it says uh, in verse 27, Satan entered into him. So there's some distance between when Satan first puts it into your heart. See, that's when you just begin to think about it a little bit. But then when you finally just turn yourself over to the devil and, and you decide once and for all that you're going through with it, see? That's verse 27. Satan entered into him. So let's recognize it <clears throat> when Satan puts something in our heart and let's make our decisions right then about what we're going to do. And let's don't wait. Let's don't simmer it on the stove and keep it and follow it until Satan enters into us. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. See, that's when Satan first puts it in our heart. Then lust, when it's conceived, brings forth sin. And sin, when it's full grown brings forth death. So here we have a good example of that. Okay? So Judas gets up and he goes out. And if you look at what is verse here, verse um, 30, after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. Underline those last words, and it was night. He went out into the night. In John, John's big about light and darkness, isn't he? And Judas went out into the night. But if you follow Jesus, where will you always be? You'll be in the light. See? And we've learned that Jesus is the light of the world. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody want to bring anything up? Brother Hollis Reynolds, way back there. One more time, I didn't quite understand. What Jesus, Judas was going to do? Okay, <clears throat> Hollis's question is, Jesus knew what Judas was going to do. Why did he choose him in the first place? I, I think Mark kind of answered this earlier. God's plan was for Jesus to die. So why would Jesus choose a thief to be one of his disciples? Because he knew that that temptation, which he had not repented of, would probably lead him to do what God needed done. It's best I can do with it. Okay? <clears throat> My brother Stan. Yes. Stan's comment, for those of you that couldn't hear, the, the wonderful humility and compassion Jesus had to wash Judas' feet because Judas betrayed him. But we betrayed him, didn't we? All of us did. And all of us have done things that are contrary to Jesus. And yes, yet he died for us while we were still sinners, while we were still unrepentant. So <clears throat> perhaps that's something to take note of as well. All right. 
Now, for the next few minutes, let's think about the Holy Spirit's work through the apostles. Now, the Holy Spirit lives and works in us as well, but he worked in the apostles in some unique ways. Now, every writer of the New Testament, <clears throat> some writers more than others, talk about the Holy Spirit. Paul talks extensively about the Holy Spirit. Luke talks extensively about the Holy Spirit. John talks quite a bit about the Holy Spirit, but each one of those writers, by divine inspiration, approaches that subject from a little different standpoint. In the books of John, John talks about the Holy Spirit in three primary ways. He talks about the Holy Spirit as a witness to the divinity of Jesus. When he came down on Jesus at his baptism, this is my son, you know, he talks about the Holy Spirit as a witness. He talks about the Holy Spirit as a transformer, not transformers, more than meets the eyes. No, a different kind of transformer. He talks about... <laughs> He talks about a transformer of lives, a transformer of our souls, a transformer of our minds, see? And so this is, a, this is the perspective of the Spirit's work in the new birth, in regeneration, the transformation of individuals. That's another big emphasis of John. But a third emphasis of John is the Holy Spirit as a revealer of God's word. And this emphasis is strictly in the ministry in John's gospel of the apostles, okay? And so in John's gospel, <clears throat> we have this word that's used for the Holy Spirit, parakleton. Uh, look at John 14, everybody. And let's look at verse 16. Now, some of you are going to have this translated different ways. Um I will ask the Father, and he will give you another something. What do we have in different translations? Another what, Craig? Counselor, Counselor helper, comforter, advocate. Isn't that interesting? Advocate, counselor, comforter, helper. Those are all legitimate translations of parakleton, depending on the, <clears throat> on the context. And so, um, let's look at the verse again. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Another helper. He will give you another helper. See, that implies that Jesus himself was a what? He was a helper. He was a comforter. He was a counselor. So they'd had Jesus with them all this time. Remember we were talking about how upset they were because this one that they depended on so much for everything, he was their helper, counselor, comforter, whatever you want to say. He was leaving, but God was going to give them another helper. See? So Jesus was a helper. They depended on him completely. God's going to give you another helper. It means another of the same kind. See? <clears throat> All right, so... Then if you drop down to, oh, well, by the way, in John's narrative, he calls the Holy Spirit three things. He calls him the Holy Spirit or just the Spirit. He calls him the Spirit of Truth, and he calls him the Helper, Comforter, however yours translates that. All right, in John 14, 25 and 26, these things have I spoken to you while abiding with you. See, why does he say while abiding with you? Because he's already told them he's going to do what? He's leaving. See, so I've said these things while abiding with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you. Now, see, this is, it's important to know who we're talking about here. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. And he will bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Okay, so 
in context, if you go back to chapter 13, he's talking to these 12 apostles. Actually, here he's talking to 11 of them because Judas has gone out. The Holy Spirit will come to you. He will teach you everything. That's a lot, don't you think? Notice the last part of that. He will bring to your remembrance everything I said to you. How did the apostles, I mean, did any of you have photographic memories? And could you, after the sermon this morning, write down every, every word I said just by memory? Now, you might be amazing, but how in the world did Matthew, years after the fact, remember the Sermon on the Mount to write that dude down? He will bring to your remembrance everything I said to you. See? <clears throat> or do you think Matthew took shorthand, like, Miss Donna, you take shorthand, or you used to. When I first came here, it's funny because I was so wet behind the ears, and I'd need a letter done, and I'd say, Miss Donna, can you take a letter? And man, she'd just dash off that shorthand. But um, <clears throat> Matthew takes shorthand and just shorthand down the Sermon on the Mount while Jesus was saying it? I don't think so. Um, so, what did the Holy Spirit do with the apostles? He teach you all things. He'll bring to your remembrance everything I said to you. All right, let's look at another one. By the way, the reason I threw this one in John 15, 16, they're still around the table. This passage shows real conclusively who he's talking to and who he's not. He says to them, you did not choose me. I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and that you should bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. He's not talking about you and me. We choose Jesus. We can accept him or deny him. But Jesus called them one by one. Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He stayed up praying all night and he said, I want you. And I want you. And I want you. And I want you. You guys. I'm choosing you. Come follow me. He appointed them to be apostles. <clears throat> okay? The conversation from John 13 to John 17 is a conversation between Jesus and the apostles. See, many people read these verses and they think that what he says to the apostles applies to all of them, that the Holy Spirit's going to speak directly to all of you and teach you all everything directly. He's going to bring to your remembrance everything Jesus ever said directly in your personal mind. That's not what's happening here. You with me? Okay. <clears throat> so in John uh, 15, verse 26, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. See, that goes all the way back to chapter 14, verse 16. That is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness of me, and you will bear witness. So when those apostles went out and began to bear witness to Jesus, starting at Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit who came upon them at Pentecost was bearing witness to Jesus through the preaching and teaching of those apostles. See, he was doing that directly. So what's he going to do? 1426, he's going to teach you everything. 1426, he's going to bring to your remembrance everything I ever said. 1526, he's going to bear witness about me. 167, they're, they're still, if you read all the in-between conversation, they're really upset because he's going away. He says, look, I tell you the truth, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he was going to do that through the preaching of, guess who? The apostles. 
and those that the apostles then trained. Okay? <clears throat> Look at John 16, verse 12. I have many more things to say to you guys, but you can't bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you the things that are to come. See, how did the apostles know what was going to happen in the future? Right here. He will disclose to you the things that are to come. Now, one more, and we'll let the lesson be yours. John 17, 20. John 17, 9 through 19, he prays for the apostles. Then John 17, 20. I don't pray for these guys only, but underline it in big underline. For all those who will believe on me. How? Through their word. That's what we have in the New Testament. Okay, 